And may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Surely this was written by someone who's been aware of God's presence in their life for some years. It's what you might expect from the writings of a medieval mystic, but it cannot have been written less than 300 years before Christ. It's ascribed to King David himself and echoes the spiritual intimacy we find in other Psalms attributed to him, in which case it dates from around 900 BC, and that's nearly 3,000 years ago. It's a truly astonishing Psalm. The reason I'm saying it was written by someone who's known God for some years is that it's not straightforward to reach a place where you are comfortable with God's intimate knowledge of everything about you. I have a memory from my youth of there being times when I preferred not to remember God's claim of absolute sovereignty over my life with all my youthful hopes and ambitions. And I can claim good company in this. I make no claim to C.S. Lewis' intellectual profundity, but I can remember being faced with a similar decision. Enough had been thought and said and felt and imagined, writes Lewis in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. I w it was about time that something should be done. You must picture me alone in that room in my college, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even from a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. When you have good prospects and are looking forward to life, it can be hard to surrender your life to God. It's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom. But I am here to bear witness that it is worth it. Once I had made that surrender, I ended up, as I may have mentioned before, working in a probation hostel in Brixton. At that time, it felt to me like the ends of the earth. But just as David says in this psalm, I found God is there. Because he knows us so intimately, as this psalm says, he knows what we can cope with. And he also knows the degree of pressure that will be needed to make us who he intends us to be. This sounds an alarming prospect, but his hand is on us. He knows what he is doing, and he is with us wherever we may end up. It took some years, but I ended up discovering who I really was, a truly liberating experience. There really is no escape from his presence. The psalm says you will find God even in Sheol, the land of the dead. That's verse 8 in the original Hebrew and in the older English versions. Sheol, the belief in a shadowy afterlife the Hebrews used to share with their neighbors until, and there are hints of this in the Old Testament, hope of a true resurrection came into their faith, a hope emphatically affirmed by Jesus. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. I'm left with the impression of hell being a kind of lunatic asylum for people who can't stand God's presence. But it seems you're not quite safe from God, even in hell. Jesus holds the keys. And St. Peter says that after his resurrection, he preached to the spirits in prison. Hence the notion of the harrowing of hell so graphically portrayed in the old mystery plays when the risen Jesus marches into hell and bursts back out with all the prisoners he has set free. There really is no escape from God's presence. Which means 
we really need to come to terms with his presence, however reluctantly, like C.S. Lewis, or joyfully, because we've discovered a real hope for our lives. But we have to make that decision and acknowledge that Lord God's sovereign claim on our life. And then that presence which may have seemed such a threat becomes instead our hope and our joy. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now hold on to your hats for a brief burst of philosophy. Does that mean that everything's predetermined, that we have no choice in what we do? No, it does not. Remember, God is in eternity, and so time does not work the same way for him as it does for us. He is alongside us, outside time, and sees all we do. But he has created us free to make choices within the options available to us, so that we are able to learn to return his love. As the psalm wisely says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Instead, we can simply enjoy it, praising him because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He has known everything about each one of us ever since we began to grow in our mother's womb. I love the way David says when he gets to the end of all his philosophizing. When I awake, I'm still with you. Now we come to verse 21. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. In the old version, I hate them with perfect hatred. <laughs> Is such a thing as perfect hatred possible? David's perfect hatred is directed against God's enemies. Remember Jesus' furious denunciation of the religious leaders of his day, whose obsession with trying to get everything right made it impossible for ordinary people to believe that God cared for them. God is determined that we shall be free to become all he intends us to be. And the other side of this determination is his implacable hatred of everything that stands in the way of that. My own recent experience of our diocese safeguarding leadership course has made me acutely aware of how the horror of child abuse has infiltrated the Church of England. Is there any appropriate reaction to that other than anger? a white-hot anger that determines this shall not be tolerated. As a church, we are called, like the prophets of old, to be a constant threat to every form of oppression, because Jesus came to set the oppressed free. He has called us to love our enemies, but not to tolerate their activities. Repentance remains an open door. There is always a way back to God. But those who would repent must come to terms with the changes he will demand in their lives because of his implacable love. It is appropriate that immediately after speaking of perfect hatred, David calls on God to search me and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Perfect hatred must be kept in its place, directed at precise targets God has identified. It must not come to dominate our lives. Now God's intimate knowledge of us has become liberating. He will, when we have opened our lives to him, review our deepest thoughts and free us from anything that would lead us astray. And so the psalm ends with a lovely promise that he will lead us in the way everlasting. There's been a considerable element of threat in what I've been saying, God's inescapable presence, whether we want him there or not. 
God's implacable hatred of all that would separate us from him and drive us from his presence. But David has long ago come to terms with God's presence and his demands on our life. And for David, as for all of us who've done likewise, this psalm is a celebration of that challenging but reassuring presence, which is for us a sheer delight. So here is the call for us today. Maybe this challenging but reassuring presence is somehow missing from your life. Or maybe for you, God's presence is something of an uncomfortable threat. Agree with your adversary quickly, says Jesus. I know this may not be easy, and I can't promise your life will be easy as a consequence, but I can promise that it's worth it. It's what we were made for. It's why we are here. In either case, we would love to pray with you for peace in God's presence so that you can know his hand on your life and he can lead you in the way everlasting. Amen. <laughs>